Hi, good evening, and welcome to your favorite channel, Myths, Mysteries, and Majesty. I have this habit of saying 3M because I sometimes mess up when I say the channel's name too fast. But I just wanted to emphasize because I love the name. It took me like a month, almost a month or something, to come up with a name. But yes, welcome, everyone. Uh, and I'm pleased to, uh, to be a host to two wonderful gentlemen, my brothers, and uh, my... Um, my friends in pen, if I can put it that way, Christian authors. And we will be dealing tonight uh, with uh, a very similar topic like last time, but we will continue where we left last time. So uh, Daniel and Zachariah, uh, welcome. How are you feeling tonight? Feeling good. Had a rough night with the baby last night, so I'm a little fatigued in the head, but doing well there have been worse nights <laughs> yeah i'm ready to get back to it i'm ready to get into the the nitty-gritty of the craft here cool well first i'm i'm sorry for that daniel uh but i'm excited for you uh, uh zachariah okay so we we shall be talking about uh storytelling and world building when it comes to uh your works of fiction um let's kick in with the first question. Uh, how do you build your imaginary worlds? Um, the setting, the plot, everything. Um, as authors, how do you, uh, do you first visualize stuff uh, in your mind? Or is it easier for you to build, to just do the outline and put one by one? How, how is this the whole process of uh, creating this imaginary world? Maybe we can start with you, Daniel. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic because while I did write a like a post-apocalyptic dystopia, I'm working on uh, a fantasy world with my brother. We're going to kind of co-author a, a fantasy. Yeah, we're going to co-author a fantasy book together. And uh, he's been running a and d campaign in this world for over a year. And he's been using a lot of fantasy ideas that I cooked up from back when I was a teenager, he was like, oh, Daniel, could you send me like all your old documents about that fantasy world you were making? And he just took it and ran with it. And he's made something really kind of cool, but he wants me to in input more into it. So we have this kind of shared doc that we're using for for building this cosmology for this world, which has been like my, my hobby and my free time lately. But the way I go about um, world building in that is... Um, you know, I've done it in the past where you don't do it the Tolkien way. You don't start from like the origins of the universe and you just like linearly play out the whole history of the world and go into every minuscule detail like the Cimmerillion does. Uh, instead, just going about like, okay, what's what's essential to the plot? What's essential to the plot? And then I'll build a world around that, you know? Uh, that's what I did for Canaan Sleeps, my last book, because the plot and the characters had so much more to do. Yes, there it is, Canaan Sleeps, in stores maybe one day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the the setting is, um, mm, well, the world is absolutely essential because there are different nations and there's politics involved and there's different ethnicities that have conflict and there's different ideologies at play. So in terms of that kind of world, um, I kind of went about that with that book, observing the world that we have right now in America or in places that have had Western influence in developing countries and kind of um, spun those into a fictional kind of uh, backdrop. So it's kind of a, a commentary, if you will, on those situations. When it comes to fantasy, it becomes a lot more abstract, I guess you could say. Uh, and I'm sure Zechariah has a lot to say about fantasy world building. But uh, like we talked about in the last episode, uh, with C.S. Lewis's method of kind of world building and fantasy. It starts with um, 
this kind of atmosphere where you know you as an author you already love this atmosphere you already have this this feeling of a world that is full of wonder and you escape out of your world into this otherworldly place that takes you to the edge of your imagination that's the beauty of the um fantasy world building in particular and c.s lewis does that really well because he doesn't you know blow a huge fanfare whenever he does this he keeps it kind of under wraps so we talked a little bit about narnia and how he kind of wove the medieval cosmos into the backdrop of the story but he didn't draw attention to it he drew attention to the humble characters and the down to earth you know street level kind of events with all of this stuff happening in the background I wouldn't say Narnia is high fantasy, but I definitely think he was applying some principles from uh, the origins of fantasy and medieval folklore and literature that are what we recognize as good fantasy literature. Um, Yeah, I'll let you take it from there, uh, Zechariah. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, I get that. Like, if you're working kind of with something Earth-like, something based on kind of our culture, either developed from our culture. Uh, The game is kind of changed because now you're working inside of this sort of strict history and you have to, you have to kind of push for accuracy in some sense. Like I'm guessing you had to think of, okay, what, which nation did this nation develop from? Like you said, you have Colorado Springs and you know kind of how that got there, right? Uh, so for instance, in my, uh, and what I'm writing, I'm actually having to juggle three different worlds at once. So I have, I have Earth and then I have two other, uh, two other settings. Uh, so I, I, have, I have run into the, into this there's kind of two ways two ways to world though one is you sit down and you say okay this is a cool idea let me let me build off of that so i'm saying okay what if what if this what if uh what if spanish conquistadors uh but they're dog people and then i go up from there right I add something to that. And I say, okay, can I uh, can I add like Hindu iconography? Uh, can I give them uh, poetry based on the Norse sagas and kind of you kind of stir it together, right? And you say, okay, who who would be interested in, uh, to have them uh, have a conflict with? And so you can just keep building from there. So again, I think I think if I remember correctly, I mentioned this uh, last time we recorded, but that the work of an author is remixing, remixing things you know, researching things, uh, researching interesting things, finding interesting cultures. I definitely recommend like reading mythologies, uh, reading history, uh, looking at statuary, poetry, everything you can bring in everything you've heard of and then mash it together mix it up find again find something you're interested in whether that be coins if it's languages like tolkien uh find that one thing that you can you can dive deep into studying and then when you write you can bring that passion on that subject with you and then you sort of build your world around this concept because now we know Tolkien kind of had world builder's disease where he just kept building and building. But he, if I remember correctly, he started with the languages. He said, these are some interesting languages. I'm going to go from there. And he's like, I, I read all this folklore. I'm going to, I'm going to add that into it. Uh, he's obviously very familiar with like this fairy lore. Uh, his elves are very much dug deep into that world things like that. You can, you can see what he's passionate in 
uh, with his writing. You can see kind of the poetry and the songs that he enjoyed as he blends those in. And the more of these, these pieces you have, uh, the more it feels like there's a fleshed out world. You don't have to go into every little thing. You don't, if you're interested in poetry, you don't necessarily have to be interested in economics. Uh, there's something called the, the iceberg theory where you see the top of the iceberg, uh, but you know there's something below the surface or you assume there is. And then you take like a little drill and you go deep into a portion of the iceberg and you're like, oh, there's this deep level level here. Everything else must be fleshed out. And that's kind of the the magic spell you want to weave is that your reader believes that there's a massive bunch of ice under there. And you can do that with your, with your passions and going deep into that thing, whether it's deep into your magic system, uh, deep into the culture, deep into the politics. Uh, just go for it. And you can do that without even having to go into exhaustive detail about the thing itself. You can yep. drop a hint somewhere that like there's a bigger world behind this thing that I'm talking about. And your reader will just kind of populate that with their own imagination. And they'll be like, wow, there's like a lot back there. Even if you didn't necessarily write a ton of backstory for that particular bit of lore, uh, dropping these subtle hints here and there that there's a bigger story at work does uh, draw them into this sort of icebergish like there's a depth there's a depth under there that maybe you didn't even write you know you don't even necessarily have to have written it but it's implied you know yeah you don't you don't have to tell your readers everything you can you can just drop little pieces here and there and uh let them put in the pieces there's an interesting thing uh in a lecture i watched it was about comedy but it was called he called this principle the hidden snowball fight or that or the hidden food fight i think uh and so the the idea the idea was that there uh there are these these kind of two groups of nerds there's like cosplayers or something they're dressing up as like characters from star trek or star wars but they kind of get into an altercation and then like a pie truck uh crashes near them and then the next uh panel shows them uh all kind of smeared in pie and it just says it was a good day to pie uh and the idea is you're imagining that pie fight in your head and the pie fight that you are imagining in your head is much funnier or much richer than the pie fight that could have been shown to you in that uh comic panel and hmm. uh sometimes you just need to leave it like that like i think this was the uh in star wars they like have this throwaway line about the clone wars right um, right and then we go back and we have these prequels and then people are kind of like oh do i like this though because the clone wars they imagined uh are always going to be better than the prequel clone wars that george lucas writes right but then they add the caveat of oh but there was the old republic in the prequels yeah. and then you're like oh what, what was the old republic and then they make something about the old republic and everyone's like eh, i don't know about that exactly and, exactly yeah. yes sometimes it's better to just kind of nod at something and not tell it because your readers are going to do that work for you. They're going to do the world building for you. Uh, it's, it's, they're, they're coloring uh, the coloring book. All you have to do is put the lines there for them. Right. Well, that was a good discussion. Um, <laughs> I bet a lot of uh, people can learn from you guys in from both episodes, whatever you're sharing, um, you know, from your experiences as writers, I believe it will be beneficial for all of them. Um, I was curious as a, as man of God, when you create all of these things, um, let's say you even draw maps, uh, you come up with names of cities and all these uh, 
places, characters, you develop, um, you know, you develop, uh, you know, their um, spiritual, emotional, mental abilities. You, you describe them, how they look physically. Um, you create all these imaginary worlds, maybe even planets and new cosmos. When you do all of these things, when you go through all this process, again, as imagers of God, which we mentioned in the last episode, do you guys feel like you're in a good way mimicking God? Because if he made us in his image and he created us, he also gives us gifts to use that resemble him, that mimic him. So I was just wondering, have you ever uh, felt this satisfaction in a way, maybe even confirmation, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It gives me pleasure because I'm mimicking God. Yeah, I think uh that is definitely part of our makeup as human beings in the image of god is that we desire to create and we have joy in creating uh but also like uh zechariah said earlier everything that we do is uh derivative you know it's it's re-spinning pre-existing ideas i think uh you mentioned that in the last episode too that uh we don't create from nothing like we do have this desire to be creators like God, uh, but we're not capable of that. There's this hierarchy that we are lower on that um, we can't just make something from nothing. We can present people with novel ideas and experiences using uh, old ideas. You know, nothing, nothing is original, but uh, you can invent these new takes on old ideas by... Uh, respinning them in unique ways so like the whole genre of fantasy as we know it today didn't exist before uh lord of the rings like you couldn't sell a fantasy book from today in uh 1933 because no one would read it they'd be like what on earth is this this is some absolute nonsense whereas now we have like this uh shared vocabulary for a lot of fantasy elements that just are standard in fantasy literature um they're all derivative but they're all unique in their own special ways you know and there's a reason people love to read them even though they don't necessarily have original ideas um that was a really big liberating idea for me as an author when i realized you don't have to be original with everything sometimes it's okay to tell an old story with new characters and it's still just as good, you know? I think some people do that the wrong way, though, where they realize, hey, I could just rewrite something that someone already wrote and put it in space or put it in a Western, and now I can just make money on that, you know? There's, like, a, a sick capitalist way of thinking of it, too. But um, that's not necessarily what I mean. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah, I have mixed I have mixed feelings on this subject. Uh, I mean, I'm familiar enough with kind of uh, Tolkien's big uh, essay on fairy stories where he's talking about how we are sub creators, right? Uh, to say that I agree that on some level where this is a mimicry of the divine, but on another level, I don't want to say that I'm very much like God because the characters I create are very flawed, uh, purposefully so, and uh, I allow terrible things to happen to them. And I don't want to think that that's how God uh, looks at us, right? Uh, right? So we have to think. There's there's a bit of there is a bit of a, a difference there. There's uh, our our privations, our flaws, our are a result of our difference from God, of our uh, our our distance from being the source of being and being mere beings and contingent, uh, rather than existing in and of ourselves. Uh, 
So in some way, the way in which we create, especially uh, in the Christian perspective, that we are we are fallen, and in that sense, even our creations are kind of fallen. They haven't achieved that perfection uh, that they could. Like, what what would a fiction work look like uh, by someone who had been glorified and ascended to the presence of God? I don't know. I don't know what that would look like. Uh, I would. I would like to imagine that it would be much better and much richer than what we're able to create right now. Mm. So in, in a sense, yes, we are, we are mimicking the divine, but in a sense, I also want to draw back and say, uh, we're not doing it that well. <laughs> and sometimes we're not doing it that well on purpose. But then again, there's this sense of, uh, you catastrophe where our stories are hopefully uh, trying to ascend to some higher level. We start with flawed characters and hopefully they're able to step upwards to rising beyond themselves and ending in a place better than where they started. So in that sense, we can see a reflection of ourselves and our kind of eschatological hopes that we ourselves will step beyond ourselves and come more into communion with God and the purposes and that he has built into us and created us for. Yeah, I like the way you put that because it's, as Christian world builders, we're uh, we're privileged to have a certain view of the world that comes from the light of Christ, that comes from the light of God, you know? Um, if we're growing in Christ and we're growing in grace, we're slowly having this old way of looking at the world that's twisted, warped, and backwards with sin into, we're starting to see things in the light, and the light is not dull and boring and void of conflict and interest like most of secular writing portrays, you know, God or the religious or the good. Uh, actually, the good is the richest part of life. The good is the most cherished thing to fight for. And it's something that has depth of color and shades and meaning. And there's so much to explore in it um that only people who are experiencing the goodness of god can represent that in in fiction and i think that's one of the reasons that um tolkien even though he doesn't necessarily make explicitly christian fiction he wrote such a compelling world was because of this inherent uh draw towards the good like characters are compelled by actual virtue and not just by selfish selfish ambition or personal power or you know that's it's one of the things that sets apart his fantasy from other modern fantasies is there's there's this awareness of a reality that is good and there's a threat to that good and the good is not stuffy and you know weak and uninteresting it's actually the most interesting thing in the cosmos and it's worth it's worth fighting for like sam says in lord of the rings you know um yeah I, that's what i would say yeah to build off of that i think i think that that might be a place to kind of discuss kind of purposes for characters because i think there are ways to write good characters that are interesting, but I think there's also uh, places for darker characters. But I think what should separate our writing from others is that it does have a purpose. Like I mentioned uh, George R. R. Martin, his kind of grim, dark world. The issue I see with his world is not that his world is inhabited by horrible people. It's that there is no 
purpose in it. It it lacks it lacks this sense of you catastrophe that the catastrophe is going to rise upward into some greater whole. It's it's just gonna be it's just gonna be uh, darkness and backstabbing all the way down, and any kind of brief moment of peace is going to end uh, in more conflict. Yeah, because and here's here's kind of one one thing that uh, I I would be wary of is that we should be able to write. Uh, characters like even with Tolkien, we have characters who are uh, morally reprehensible that do kind of serve this end goal. For instance, we have Golem, like he's uh, he's like a friend murderer uh, who's been utterly corrupted, but then he finally uh, serves this greater purpose. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. say in, in the Bible, we have, we're full of stories with very flawed and very almost sometimes a very gray to dark characters. Read yeah. the book of Judges sometime. Uh, and like Samson was a horrible person. That's <laughs> like, sure, he got things done, but man, he, he was not a good person. Right. Uh, uh, sure, his death had some some uh, positive end to it, but he, I don't think he ever became a good person. <laughs> he sucked. Uh, yeah. And even like characters uh, we might like, say King David, there are some uh, <laughs> there are some problems there. They are very much on the surface. Uh, like not even just the fact that he had a guy killed so that he could get with his wife. There's, uh, there's implications there that are, are very troubling. Right. Uh, and in scripture, it doesn't even shy away from exposing some of the character flaws of major characters that are supposed to be seen as, you know, in some circles they're seen as like, Oh, this is like a, a very positive and, uh, you know, a role model for people. Well, no, not in every case. Like Abraham was not always a role model <laughs> for everything, but in some cases he's portrayed as a role model. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, you, you are kind of left up to make some interpretations when you're reading the Bible as to whether uh, this is a good thing that's happening or not. And that's, that's engaging the reader in a thought process. It's not just regurgitating an idea like a textbook, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you have to kind of enter into the story and you have to be there. You have to sit with what happens and uh, what does that do to you? And how do you react? And um, all characters are not cut and dry. You know, there's very few uh, very clean cut characters in scripture that don't have a, um, I, I don't want to say a dark backstory, but like they have these dark elements to them, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, one author that really made me think about this is, uh, Gene Wolfe. Have you ever, uh, engaged in any of his work? I don't know. So, Gene Wolfe is like fairly slept on. Like, I mean, the, the man was this prolific uh, science fiction writer. I think he even corresponded with Tolkien. Uh, mm. at points. He wrote letters to him and they, they had back and forth. But uh, he write, wrote this fantasy epic uh, called The Book of the New Sun. And it follows this character called Severian, who's from the Guild of Torturers. Uh, in almost this uh, spoilers, uh, a kind of uh, dying Earth setting, uh, hmm. post space age, uh, and this 
a very, very morally questionable individual. He's a womanizer. I mean, he was raised by torturers, so that that's gotta lend into it. Uh, and he's an unreliable narrator. You're never sure if he's lying to you through the entire book about what actually happened. But through the course of the book, you have these very kind of almost messianic moments and uh, very clear parallels that uh, Gene Wolfe is drawing to uh, the life of Christ. And it's a very, very interesting and very thought provoking uh, story. And I, I, I wish I saw more of that from uh, fiction writers who are Christian these days. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This adds nicely to the next question I had. Um, when you guys invent your characters, so we mentioned this uh, partially in the previous episode. Obviously, you guys create heroes, um, good guys, uh, where you may or may not um, embed uh, in them something from your character. But I'm also interested in what type of other characters do you guys invent? Uh, you have to have some bad guys, some evil, something that is personified, personifying evil. When you write about evil, uh, do you find the inspiration in the Bible, not just from the devil, but also in some, um, you know, evil characters from the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. But also, what about the, those characters who are neither that good nor that wicked, who are like in between? Like, um, how do you find inspiration for both these in-between guys and for those evil guys? Um, how do you develop these characters? Um, and again, where you find inspiration for them? I've been very compelled um, by this kind of modern movement in fiction writing to have stories without an antagonist. Uh, so traditionally there's a protagonist and an antagonist. There's the good guy and there's the bad guy. And the good guy is always being thwarted by the antagonist. Um, more and more now though, in movies as well as in um, books, there's this tendency for there to be stories that there's no real bad guy. The problem is like the circumstance or the threat is an impending disaster or and then it's all about the characters themselves and what they do. Uh, my only pushback against that is a lot of times it makes it sound like there's no such thing as evil and there's only you know benign people. As a Christian, I can't believe that. I think there's, there's good and evil. And I think there are genuinely just evil forces. And But as a Christian as well, I also know our, fl our fight is not against flesh and blood. That there's, when it comes to people, there's... Um, there's a lot of different shades at work, which is why the Bible works with, like we talked about, people who are not always good or not always bad. You know, there's this there's this gray to people. Um, in my book, my last book, Cain and Sleeps, there's no antagonist. There's just people making choices. There's a there's a threat of an invasion from a different country and a disaster coming, but there's no real like here's the bad guy and he's stopping the progress of the protagonist, you know? Um, the, the thing to sit with is what are the choices that are turning people worse and worse or better and better? And how do I show that as, you know, the one who's pointing the camera, the one who's uh, narrating the events? Uh, that's to me how the story um, how these characters develop and um, add different depths of conflict. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I definitely like that. Yeah, I think we, we need to understand that there is evil, but I would say, yes, from my my understanding of evil theologically is that evil is, it is, but it isn't a real thing as such. It is 
a lack of a thing is a privation of a thing. If I, if I cut myself, there's nothing I can extract that is a cut. It's just that my skin is no longer functioning in the way that it should. Uh, so I don't know, deny that my skin is no longer functioning in the way it should, but there's no real thing in the universe called a cut uh, that I can abstract and kind of examine. Uh, right. It's the same for quite a lot of things that we would say are bad uh, when we're talking of natural evil. Uh, it's just a failure somewhere down the line or something that has a purpose that has uh, been twisted in some way. So in that sense, yes, even if you have an antagonist, there should be some reasoning there, some human way that you can understand how they reach that state. You don't always need to kind of empathize uh, with them. If you're uh, writing uh, a sociopath, uh, you shouldn't necessarily, they shouldn't necessarily be understandable to your readers or even have your readers like them. Uh, but still at the same time, they're kind of injured or born injured in some way that has caused them to take this pathway. Right. And again, for your, uh, your protagonists, uh, I do believe that flaws are inherently more interesting than strengths because it allows your character to work around those flaws or to succeed despite those things that seem to drag them down. Uh, right. If you have a guy in a wheelchair, uh, and they don't have to always have to be moral flaws, right? They can be uh, physical ones. Uh, if you have a guy in a wheelchair, his, his legs are paralyzed and he has to go out and defeat, for example, the Dark Lord, that's interesting. How is he, how is he going to get into Mordor on his wheelchair, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, uh, or uh, uh, maybe, maybe he's, uh, uh, maybe at the same time, he has a very bad temper. So maybe the people who might help him get there he like drives them away because he's uh, snapping at them or something. And then that creates conflict and uh, creates interesting situations. Right. And, and so this mix of mo uh, moral evil, natural evil, uh, they kind of blend back and forth in between each other, but those also allow you to do interesting things. I think even even comedy is tied to this. Uh, the idea that comedy can sometimes be this interrupted defense mechanism. That we perceive that something is wrong in the world and our reaction is kind of to laugh at it. Uh, uh, even something like a pun is us perceiving something is fundamentally wrong with our language. Uh, uh, dark humor is almost the purest form of humor in this, in that we perceive that evil exists and our response is to kind of point and laugh. I think this is, uh, it, it, is it is a defense mechanism, it is something that is healthy to do in some sense. Mm. Um, I have another question regarding characters you guys are developing. Uh, for me, as a reader, but also I noticed as a writer, I'm not a big fan of those authors who, when write fiction or not, uh, they spend countless of pages describing nature, how the branches are moving and shaking when the wind is blowing, um, the sky and clouds, or when they enter a certain building. I don't care like to read how you know, the, the color of every wall or how every brick looks like. And the same thing is for the character. I, this is just me. I find much more amusing 
and I can concentrate more and enjoy more novel, but also my own writing, when I pay more attention to uh, the inside, the inner qualities and attributes of, um, of a character. Um, so when I'm writing, I would pay more attention to describe someone's struggles, doubts, fears, humor, um, anxieties, um, if they're divided over some choice, any of these things, to, so we can see their changes, we can see their growth, we can see how they have um, evolved, so to speak, from point A to maybe point Z, 100, 200, 500 pages later, maybe even in another book. So I pay more attention to those things, and that's why I'm more like, I like to read more things like that, as well as dialogues, good action, instead of just describing, describing, and sometimes, and this was some other people who love fantasy, they told me the same, they're like, man, I barely finished the book because in these 50 or 100 pages, nothing happened, it was just annoying description, but, and some people give up, and but some people persevere, and you know, they may enjoy or not. They may regret or not that they went through all of that. So we're just interested when you two, uh, both of you, when you're creating your characters, um, what aspects of their development do you pay more attention to, physical or the inside, like emotional, spiritual, and mental aspects? Well, for me, when I uh, write any scene or any uh, any chapter of a of a story, I write it from a particular character's perspective. That's just the way I, I prefer to write it. If you're writing a story from just this omniscient, you know, way zoomed out perspective, I don't find that very compelling because you're not in someone else's head. Normally, uh, you're when you're reading a character's perspective, there's this sort of discontinuity, this sort of like uh, um, disruption in your own thinking where you're put in someone else's thoughts. And you have to like rethink everything and you kind of have to go with it that way. So then if I'm describing a tree moving in the wind or I'm describing a, a building, I'm describing it from their perspective and everything I describe from that perspective is going to draw attention back to their own conflict or it's going to draw attention back to their own character. What's going on in them right now? Why are they noticing this thing? Why are they experiencing this breeze of wind in a different way than another character might you know you know none of those descriptions are should be throwaway things they should all kind of reflect back to the character and in that respect the atmosphere of a story does deter is determined uh by the character you know you can't just have a world without characters it's not compelling even if it's a very intricate world and there's lots of different you know elements to the economy and politics and different races of elves and dwarves and everything it's it's not very compelling if there's no characters even the Cimmerellian is a series of stories with characters people paint it to be like a history book where there's like nothing going on except for just descriptions about what a place looks like no it's a story there's stories being told throughout the whole Cimmerellian otherwise you wouldn't care to sit down and read it you know it's it's with any myth, you know. It's it's um, from a perspective of a character, and some in, some of the most interesting stories are when you know that you're reading from an unreliable narrator. Um, one of the characters in my last book, uh, he's going down a dark path by making all these choices that are fundamentally kind of hardening his heart and severing him from his relationship with God that he had, and putting him in this new direction with uh, different kinds of people influencing his life and making these decisions that end up doing things that he would never have done in the first chapter, you know? Um, but everything I describe in that is from his perspective. And you're supposed to be like, Ooh, that's chilling. Cause it's, uh, it's supposed to rub you the wrong way. And I might be describing an alleyway or a street or a window and it's reflecting back on his character. I find that to be the most compelling uh, kind of description. Personally, I do like a lot of verbose descriptions of things. 
I try to avoid if, it. What, what if um, what if you're reading a book and this is not from one or other character uh, perspective, how they're observing the wind or the alley or the street or uh, the door or the building? What if you, uh, this is someone neutral, like the narr the narrator, the, the person who's telling the story, you? Uh, would you still uh, would you still like spend a number of pages describing just one thing? Probably not, because uh, I know people wouldn't enjoy reading that. I enjoy writing that, but it's not fun to read. <laughs> so you kind of have to write for the the reader a little bit there, because you know no one wants to read about a wall or a tree. Um, if it's in regards to how a person is seeing a tree, I think that's compelling. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To kind of summarize a little bit of what Daniel said, and something I've heard uh, before. So say two different people walk into a room uh, and they notice a glass of water. You have one person, he's from like a desert culture and he sees that water and his thoughts about that water tell you about the fact that he's from a desert culture. Water is super rare. Uh, this other person walks in and is like, who's left this, this water here? This is super cluttered. Uh, this is d disgusting. They should clean, clean more and be more tidy. Uh, yeah, those both tell different things about the characters. Uh, so everything should be there to serve, serve some purpose. Uh, if, if the purpose is, say, you are writing uh, something about a book that has strong, like, ecological overtones, and that's key to the story, maybe you want to describe more plant life or... Uh, things like that. Uh, yes, I would. I would say things do need to kind of serve a purpose. But I, I do know there are authors who do like to get into more of those things. I know uh, some people didn't like the Wheel of Time because there's a lot of descriptions of uh, like tapestries and uh, things happening. I think mm -hmm. descriptions of people those can kind of be slipped in unobtrusively. Like what I think what you're describing, uh, uh, Nicola, is that you're kind of pulled out of the story by this, uh, this thing. So there's this thing called the, uh, the pyramid of abstraction. And you want, you want things to be more concrete and you would, you would think, that describing things makes things concrete, but that isn't always the case. Uh, if your if your character is smelling something, that that makes things more concrete. That draws them down into the narrative. But if you are kind of as this disembodied narrator, just talking about things, that's almost pulling you uh, up out of the story. Uh, it's interrupting. It's right. interrupting the flow. It's not pulling you down into the here and now, uh, into the moment. And so you want to, if you're going to put things in, you want to put them, them in in ways that don't draw you out. But instead, draw you in. Right. Uh, so. I'm trying, I, I think I had an example there, but I kind of, I kind of. Yeah, you know, I wanted to mention something. I'm a type of a person who just crossed my mind. You know, when you read all three Gospels except Mark, they're much longer. You go to Mark, if you pay attention, and I noticed this only when I started going to movies, so we, we had to read like uh, a lot of the Bible. So I was reading the Gospel of Mark. I remember this. I was sitting at school and reading and paying attention. And the word immediately, 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 immediately. Yeah, yeah. It happens so right. many times. And then I I don't know, was it through a textbook or a website or a professor? I don't know who told me. But like, because Mark's Gospel was written for the Romans and Romans were like people of action. They didn't want to have like a lot of description and side details. They, they, they wanted to see what's happening like fast, like 
like rapido, you know, from 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 one point to another point. That's why the the narrator Mark would put immediately, immediately. And and now that I'm thinking, that that's kind of person. I like those kind of movies, those kind of TV shows. I don't. It throws me off when I start reading a book or watch a TV show. Uh, if like the first, I don't know how, maybe 20, 30 minutes in a TV show or maybe in a book, first 50 pages, if they're so slow, I'm so tempted to give up. And that happened to me even back in, um, you guys, I don't even know that you know about this, but back in 1999, I think it was 1999, maybe year 2000, it was one of the best video games that that was ever invented and when it came out it brought revolution in the industry of, of video games it was called half life later sequels came out half life 2 whatever half life was for me insanely annoying the first one hour because you had no weapons no uniform you had to find these things and then the fight starts but i didn't know that that will come or when will it come? I was like, why is this game? Like, why everyone loves the game? It was like so annoying. But once when I did the first part, then the fun started. And I was really enjoying the game. So I find that in myself, if a movie or a novel or a game or anything has such a slow beginning, I'm so tempted to give up quickly. I don't know if you guys are the same. All right. So... I, w I want to back up for a second because I, f I figured uh, out what I was about to say, but I want to continue on on that point too because I see I see what you're talking about there, uh, and I, I know what the problem is there, and it's a good thing to talk about. So there's a thing in uh, dialogue called uh, beats, and you can slip in a lot of things into beats, a lot of descriptions, so that they kind of go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing with dialogue is dialogue, if it goes on for too long, can become very abstract. And it can almost feel like the characters are now in a white room having a conversation. And so you want to add little pieces of description to kind of pull them back down. So you're like, oh, they're in a room right now. Uh, they're around a table. So you have them say something and then you have them pick up some food with this fork. Uh, and that allows you to describe something, but it also lets you kind of remind the reader without them noticing it, that they're at a table and that they're eating. Or you can add in little bits about the person who's talking, like their description, like he, uh, he slicked back his oily hair or something, right? Uh, his oily black hair. And so now I know that this person has black hair and it's black hair is oily, but I don't necessarily notice that the author told me that because it's sandwiched in between two bits of dialogue. Uh, so that's ways to kind of put descriptions of objects and people. And this was, a, this was something I ran into, something that I had to fix between my first and second draft or my second and third. So it's something I need to work more on is I had, like entire blocks where they're describing a character that they're seeing. And I'm like, I don't actually need to do that. I can like split up this, this character description in ways that it doesn't feel like they're being pulled out of the story just to be told in detail what this person looks like. And, but back to your question, uh, uh, Nicola, I think the problem you're describing is kind of promises and payoffs. Uh, the issue is, is that you weren't, you weren't promised uh, that they would get the weapons. Uh, and that's why you, you felt like, I don't like this story. I want to, I want to stop. And that's one of the reasons why we have the fantasy prologue is because sometimes these stories start off on like, uh, a farm or a village or something. Uh, but you want to promise the reader that this is going to be an action packed adventure. So wheel of time does this. It starts off with this prologue where like this, there's immense magic happening. A uh, bunch of people are dead. This guy is going insane. Uh, the world is ending. 
And then chapter one, it starts off in like this humble hamlet with these uh, nice rural farmers. But you now have the promise in your head that this is going to be a story full of like crazy magic and people going insane and like world shifting plots. So back, back to you, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like what you're saying there because a lot of the stories that I do like, like with C.S. Lewis or Tolkien or uh, other, other, other of those um, older forms of fantasy and sci-fi, they don't, they don't have that kind of immediate payoff or they don't have that immediate kind of formula where they're going to promise you something that's going to come later in the story. They do take their time. And, you know, I've, I've come to appreciate both forms, you know, where I can sit in something that is slow moving and isn't going to develop immediately or promise something that's going to develop later. Um, but also now, since I am a modern man and I'm a modern reader of things, I like that, like what Nicola is describing, something that, you know, involves me in the action quickly so that when the downbeat comes, I'm able to rest in the reassurance that, okay, this is going to pick up again later on. Like uh, my book starts with, um, my, my book takes place in a pretty uh, peaceful nation and the threat is going to be this invasion coming later. But the book starts with a shootout and it's an event that takes place in the middle of the plot, in the timeline of the plot. But I start with it at first to promise this is coming later. Look for it later. And then it comes up to that. Uh, then the next chapter is like a church service on a Sunday morning and a family conversation. And it's like nothing could be more, you know, peaceful. Yeah. Another, but if I started with that, who would finish the book? Like they'd be like, this is so boring. I don't want to read this. Um. Yeah, and uh, another the classic example of this, or a couple classic examples of this are like the both uh, Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Star Wars, mm -hmm. it doesn't start off with Luke on a moisture farm. It starts off with one giant ship pursuing this smaller ship, and then there's a yeah. shootout, and then we uh, we we go to the the rural farm boy. Uh, or Indiana Jones, it's like this tiny contained action scene, which is like the entire story in like, uh, he's like going into this tomb, he's trying to get this thing, he kind of fails, uh, he escapes. But we're promised that this is a story about a man who goes into tubes and gets things. <laughs> right, and, uh, yeah. So that's, promises are always important. If you're going to give someone a certain type of story, you want to, you want to promise that even if that promise is hidden, uh, you want to, to foreshadow that in some way so that what does happen is like, Oh, that is what that was about. Uh, those mm -hmm. kind of moments. And if you do, uh, act, there are going to be moments where you accidentally promise things, uh, and you have to kind of fix those to make sure you're not promising things you're not going to give the reader. So if you begin the story with a shootout and then everything else, uh, there's no action in the rest of the book, you've kind of lied to your reader. You don't want, right. to, you don't want to do that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I know that you guys mentioned this earlier, maybe even in the previous episode, but maybe also today. Uh, when you compare Lewis and Tolkien, which Christian author would you prefer to be and which one are you? And if you can please explain why, it doesn't have to be a lengthy explanation, just why would you prefer either or? All right, all right. So I, my, my, first, my first love is Lewis, right? He's the one who introduced me to everything. But as a writer, I find myself gravitating much more to Tolkien, uh, creating a fret, kind of creating there's kind of a sense of ep epic scale, uh, to Tolkien, uh, that e even though Lewis is writing, uh, these massive, massive worlds, like the, 
they, he even has like an entire multiverse in the world between worlds. There is something much more grandiose. I think this comes back to this idea that there's a feeling behind fiction uh, that is what you're capturing. And I'm more closely drawn to writing the kind of thing that Tolkien captures uh, in The Lord of the Rings. If That's that interesting. Makes yeah. Because if it were to be fantasy, absolutely, I would say I want to be Tolkien, you know, because I think his approach to fantasy was, you know, the benchmark for everyone who writes fantasy. Um, but I, I, I'm also more compelled by C.S. Lewis's method of teaching um, truth through a story and doing that intentionally, because a lot of his books and his especially the space trilogy, which I, I it's my, one of my favorite uh, fictions of his is that um, each of the books kind of corresponds to different essays he was writing at the same time. Like um, the abolition of man, you can get the whole story of uh, that hideous strength in his essay, the abolition of man, uh, except he was putting it into a fictional story so that it was easier to digest. And some would argue it wasn't very easy to digest and it's usually people's least favorite book. But for me, it was like, I read Abolition of Man, didn't quite get it. And then I read The Idea of Strength and everything just clicked. Um, that's what I want to do for people. I want to I want to kind of put that idea that is kind of difficult to grasp and kind of dry when written in prose and put it into a story that puts them in the shoes of people who are experiencing these ideas for the first time and have that idea kind of come together for the reader by themselves as if it was like their own idea. I think fiction is really powerful to do that. All right, I have, a, I have another another thought here on the kind of thing of Harrison. So both, both Tolkien and Lewis are great writers. However, I, it's almost as if Tolkien kind of plants the seed, whereas Lewis is giving you either the tree or like a sapling. Uh, and I think history has kind of shown that Tolkien's approach kind of has staying power. Uh, and I think, I think it is somewhat about what audience you're going for. So for instance, if I'm going, if I'm writing for a Christian audience, then maybe I want to, maybe I want to be more like uh, Lewis and kind of be more on the nose with some of my ideas. But if I am trying to kind of have something that is going to be around like slowly planting seeds over time, I think Tolkien's approach is going to be kind of a more long-term uh, uh, sleeper agent type situation, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was also wondering, um, how do you guys find balance between writing, writing under pressure because maybe of deadlines, um, deadlines in any sense, maybe your editor, publishing company, maybe you need, <laughs> I mean, it's not embarrassing to say maybe if you're writing, not just for enjoyment, but you also need money. So how do you write, how do you find balance between writing uh, under pressure and writing out of passion? How do you find that when it comes to time, when it comes to dedication, when it comes to um, does more pressure means necessarily less time for creativity? Um, how do, yes, I was just interested, like, how do you find balance with, be, between pressure and passion? For me, I think, um, my tendency is to kind of ignore something unless there's a deadline. So for me, it's helpful to have a deadline because then uh, 
like for my book, I set a date for the publication of my book, even though I was the one publishing the book, because I knew otherwise I was just going to draw this out for the next like two years. So I just need to like set a date and just work at it as hard as I can until I get there. And I think that worked out really well for me. I didn't, I wouldn't have thought that would have worked out well if I hadn't have gone through uh, Bible college (laughs) because the deadlines just became part of my DNA. And I I found that I could actually produce pretty quality stuff because I had to, you know, it wasn't just that I had to just knock out 2000 words in a day. It was that suddenly I'm giving myself time in the day to think about it. And that time in the day to think about it, kind of rekindles that passion and that passion then fuels it. If I was just running off of a, a raw deadline without any passion for what I was writing, uh, then it's absolutely not worth it. But I do think the, uh, for me, passion comes from just giving it time and giving it time takes a deadline. You know, they're all kind of connected for me. It's kind of my, my cheat way of answering that question. <laughs> Uh, Daniel just casually describing most people who have ADHD. (laughs) I also do have ADHD, so (laughs) there. Yeah, I was guessing. I was guessing that. uh, Yeah, that's. uh, uh, Maybe you should uh, ask some uh, more neurotypical people that question, uh, (laughs) Nicola. But yeah, I think. Yeah, again, for me, if I don't kind of have that place where I kind of force myself to do something, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, so I had to I had to put myself on that 2,000 word a day schedule and have that. I will write 2,000 words every day, even if it's terrible and the, the sto- I don't like the story at all because then I can go back when I'm more relaxed and I can – revise and fix what I messed up down the line. For me, it, it was just getting it down. And then that opens up more space for creativity later. Um, Zachariah, that, that explains a lot. Because whenever when we contact you and when I contact you, that explains why you need hours and days to respond on Facebook messages. <laughs> sometimes it will be like something personal, sometimes for the channel. And like, Zechariah doesn't show up in days and then he comes and like he missed all the dialogues. Of course. <laughs> and now it makes sense because he's been typing. I'm trying to do the math in my head. If you've been typing about uh, 2000 words per day, that's about eight pages in word, correct? Maybe I'm just using Google Doc. Uh, well, okay, because because usually Thank yeah, you. usually a page in Word that has a Microsoft Word that has a double space, one page usually has 250 words. So I'm just trying to, you know, so about eight pages in Word you would type a day. Hmm. That's that's impressive, you know. I, I don't know how do you do it, but I think it was George Martin or I don't know which fantasy author said years ago when he was asked, hey, well, actually, maybe not George Martin because he's, I never heard, uh, read him, but I heard that he's notoriously slow to make sequels. He's very slow and maybe even lazy. But I don't know which famous book author said uh, when they asked him, you know, how does he manage to write you know, all these books? Maybe it was Stephen King. I can't remember. But basically he said, because you have mortgage. <laughs> so <laughs> he was honest, like that motivates you to write. You have bills to pay because there are people who, that's all they do that that's you know it's not like their hobby or second job that's all they do so like that was funny but such a real answer like wake up like you have to do this i'm not like that especially when you know because of school and when i started tv i mean youtube channel i'm not like that but i admire you zachary i just wish you also have more time for us i'm being selfish yeah, I, I come from, I don't come from the uh, George R. R. Martin Patrick Rothfuss school. I come from the Brandon Sanderson school where he puts out two or three books a year uh, and then decides to make an entire Kickstarter where he's like, oh, by the way, I wrote six more books. <laughs> uh. <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm so not that way. <laughs> I want to... 
pause to encourage our other writers might be watching this that you don't have to write 2,000 words a day to be a successful writer. Yeah, so you yeah, probably should are, be yeah. writing 500 to 1,000 words a day if you want to put out a book. Yeah. You do, yeah, you do want to have like some sort of d uh, daily thing where you're putting in the effort. As long as you're putting in like some efforts uh, regularly, uh, I think, yeah, that is, that is going to be your thing. But if you're like, really want to up your level, then increase that <laughs> word count. <laughs> really just but, like, uh, grinding those, those word counts. Yeah, it is. That is, it, it is uh, like your, your grinding experience in a video game. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Where, where, where were we? Where was the conversation? No, um, yeah. Uh, I was about to say uh, we came to the concluding section, um, you know, of this second episode. I just have two brief questions for you guys. The first one is uh, what advice would you give to those writers of fiction who are just about to begin? It can be anything helpful you already gave a lot of advice throughout the episode what, what would be your concluding thoughts for anyone who's about to begin my first bit of advice would be um don't quit your day job um it's not going to pay the bills and it might not ever pay the bills and you have to be okay with that if it does along the way that's great but um, if you're getting into it to pay the bills, you're getting in it, into it to meet a market that uh, means that you're probably just writing something that isn't worth writing. So write something that you actually want to write, I guess is my advice. You know, don't, don't try to be someone else uh, just to sell something. Um, there are some places where maybe you need to compromise your style because it's just not what people want. But don't try to be someone else to sell your book. As as cliche as it says, as it sounds, be yourself and write what you love, and you can't go wrong. Um, yeah, that's that's my cliche advice for you. All right, my my advice is just start writing. Uh, turn off turn off your internal editor. Uh, you don't need to be a perfectionist. What you want to do is you want to write a, a, a completely terrible first draft of a book. Uh, your the skill comes in when you go back and revise it. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Yes. Also, don't be afraid to show it to people. I I cannot count on my hands like how many people I have met who have written something that they are convinced is so bad they can't show it to anyone. And it's like, well, then you're never going to do anything with it. Just shop it around. Get so, you, One, you're not going to get the encouragement you need if you don't shop it around. And two, you're not going to get the constructive criticism you need to make it better if it is bad. So don't be afraid to show it to people because you're not going to grow otherwise. Um, and who knows, you might actually have gold on the first go. You wouldn't know unless you showed it to someone, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, helpful criticism is always is always going to be helpful. It's going to be good to know what kind of criticism is helpful versus what kind isn't. Somebody might read your book and be like, you know, what would be really cool is if you add vampires, and uh, and maybe like, well, oh, maybe I should add vampires, and then you show it to someone else, and it's like. You know what would be really cool if this was a romance. It's like <laughs> you don't <laughs> you don't want to get into that uh, that line of things. What you're looking for is people saying, uh, "I was kind of bored here," or "This part was especially interesting," or you know, this dialogue kind of sounded unrealistic. Uh, you want people's impressions of what you've written. And that way you can diagnose maybe there's a problem and then figure out why they feel that way. Maybe, yeah. maybe you want them to feel that way. Uh, maybe this is a character uh, who has trouble communicating. So their dialogue is going to be very wooden, but that's, that's what you're going to be looking for. 
but yeah, don't be afraid to show it to people. If you don't show it to people and it's uh, sucky, which it probably is, it's your first, it's your first work, uh, then you're not going to figure out how to revise it. And if you just say, okay, my first story is terrible. I'm going to put this down and start a new one. You're not going to learn the skill of making that story better, uh, improving it. Because even even established authors, their first draft is going to kind of suck sometimes, right. and they're going to have to they're going to have to use that particular skill to fix it. Um, I hate to draw this out into one more bit of advice. This will be the last <laughs> advice I give. Okay, uh, write short stories, because one short stories practice so many skills at once. It's like having uh, training weights on your ankles for running. You know, you have to keep it below 7,000 words, you know, set, set that limit and write a compelling story in that space. If you can do that, you can write a compelling story in, you know, 500 pages. Uh, also, you can use short stories to market yourself as an author to readers. Most readers aren't going to read a full book from an author who's never published anything before. They're going to want to sample some of his work. So, you know, use uh, something like book funnel or story origin. And there's people out there eager to read short stories. I was surprised to find that there are lots of people who just download free short stories from writers that uh, write in a particular genre and they'll just read multiple a month, you know. And then if they like your work, they're going to keep an eye on you and they're going to wait until you publish something and then you have readers. There's there's no end of benefits to short stories. I hate writing short stories because it's difficult. But also, yes, yes. Just the same way I hate doing push-ups. You know, it's you're never going to get better unless you just put in the hard work on that. And eventually you actually do begin to enjoy it. I enjoyed this last short story I wrote. I looked forward to writing it and I look forward to, to editing to editing it, uh, which is seldom the case for me. So that's my last bit of advice. I promise. I mean, you're you're right about getting it put getting yourself out there. I mean, the same thing works with like web serials, right? If you're if you're into that, you can do that, build up that fan base of people who are like reading your stories and then Maybe you can turn that story into a book. Maybe you can turn something else into a book. But you already have that group of people who's already started to trust that you can tell a story and that they like your stories. Yeah. This is the last question, I promise, in this concluding uh, segment. Uh, and I'm asking you this both as uh, people who read fiction and who write fiction. Aren't you frustrated? when you observe the global church and all the believers, including in your local churches, including among your friends or, you know, family members and extended family members who lack interest in reading fiction, who don't see the beauty in it, who, don't, who can't find meaning, who can't see God-given creativity, uh, are you, I I know I'm frustrated by the lack of people whom I know in person who just don't like reading, period, unless it's Bible or devotions. So they don't read, they won't read textbooks I'm reading, they won't read novels. And um I can't help it but feel frustrated. Um because I would wish for their own benefit that they read more, but also once if they would start that, we can go deeper in our conversations and I can have more nerdy friends instead of finding those type of friends mostly online. So would you too, both as readers and authors, share the same frustration or not when you see this lack of uh, interest of people, not just reading fantasy, but also appreciating the beauty of all these fictional worlds, characters, plot themes, especially when they resemble some biblical truths? Yeah, I would say I, I do kind of share the frustration, um, especially because if you are a 
a Christian who loves the scriptures, you're already reading something that is full of stories and, you know, shades and uh, of plot and dialogue and uh, the whole Bible's a narrative. So why are you not interested in reading other narratives that contain truth? Are you nervous of, you know, allowing anything to enter your mind that isn't completely vetted truth? Like, can you not make some sort of choice for yourself? Um, yeah, I, I, I do share that frustration, certainly. Especially when it comes to books where it's just like, oh, there's magic or witchcraft in the book. Therefore, this cannot be Christian. Uh, <laughs> growing up in a more fundamentalist upbringing like Lord of the Rings, some friends couldn't read Lord of the Rings because there's mention of magic in it. Um, I wasn't allowed to read Harry Potter, but now as an adult, I don't want to read Harry Potter anyways. Uh, <laughs> I do enjoy the movies, though. That is something I go back to a lot. So make of that what you will. But um, if I were to try to convince someone to start reading fiction, I don't know where I would start. And I, I don't think I would start with just uh, contemporary fantasy either. I think, well, I'd probably just recommend the books that I started with and say, here's what I started with. This is what got me into this. If you're at all interested, um, this is what I know that uh, is good. And that's probably where I would start. Yeah, it is. It is frustrating. It's almost it's almost like uh, you're trying to describe uh, the beautiful colors you're seeing to uh, a blind man at times. Uh, like it just it's it is it is it is frustrating. Uh, I think for me. I've learned to understand that due to the situation uh, I've been placed in, uh, that I have been privileged uh, to experience this. What would have happened if I didn't find that set of books by C.S. Lewis at my grandparents' house? If I hadn't picked those up and read them, uh, who would I be now? Uh, would I be someone who just wasn't interested? I don't know. So in some sense, I'm inspired uh, with gratitude uh, for where I am as a reader. And I hope that the people uh, who follow similar paths to me will enjoy anything that I create. And that's, that's where it is. Nicola, I know you said that uh, this was the last question, correct? Um, I promised a friend that I would mention this author earlier and I completely forgot to. So now I'm gonna mention, um, and I know Zechariah, you know who I'm talking about. Um, if you are at all interested in C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, uh, they both had a shared mentor named George MacDonald, who Ooh. is the father of fantasy. And I, you may or may not agree with me there, but he is by far one of my favorite authors. And um, he is the one who kind of uh, uh, began the sort of romantic thinking in both of their upbringings that brought them to write fantasy in either Tolkien's case with Lord of the Rings or C.S. Lewis with Narnia. And um, I would start with the book Fantasties by George MacDonald. It's it's the kind of book that Nicola could not stand. You would hate <laughs> this book. It is so slow and it is so descriptive of everything, but it is so rich with atmosphere that I, I reread it multiple times a year. Uh, so there you have it. Um, you Mac know what's interesting? I've been thinking so many times to buy his collection of uh, stories and it collect it contains that one, something called Lilith, some prince or princess. I can't remember correctly. 
Yeah. This isn't the Godfather. Yeah. It has like most famous four or five uh, stories. But the thing is, um, I didn't buy it yet, even though I heard all the best about him because like Daniel, you said you hate short stories. I don't like short stories either. I would rather have a novel. No, I don't like a sequel of 10, 10 novels in a series. I hate those two. I like, like, give me up one book or two or three. But I was just thinking, uh, did uh, did he write only stories or he also has like uh, books that contain just one uh, one novel, one yeah, yeah, entire Oh, right. yeah, no, you, he has, I have Fantasties right here. It's just one novel. Um, and I have Lilith as well. Uh, yeah, got a nice... Uh... There's like a nice special edition printed at Lilith with nice illustrations that just came out. I got that. Oh, really? I did not know that. Wait, is Lilith, is his Lilith uh, related to biblical Lilith or no? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> biblical <laughs> Lilith is not a thing. Uh, Actually, it is. It, it's it's a screeching owl mentioned in the Old Testament as a demon. Well, I'm not talking about uh, the fake wife of Adam. I'm talking about the demonic creature in the Old Testament. Okay, yeah, Lilith is the uh, uh, wife of Adam, the first wife of Adam who came from the angelic realm in um, Kabbalah, which is the Jewish uh, cult. Mysticism. But yeah. Um, yeah, the book is not necessarily about that. It's borrowing from the mythology of Lilith in a very compelling way, illustrating a redemptive arc for her character who is like she's worse than any sort of antagonist she's uh, uh thoroughly a demonic character but there's this it's it's him explaining his view of um salvation really in the in the whole fantasy fantasy novel of lilith going from her introduction to uh, her salvation in the end of the book which got a lot of flack from a lot of evangelicals a lot of evangelicals don't like it because it smacks of uh universalism a little bit yeah, George a universalist, yes. it's really <laughs> zach, zach you as a another divine council nerd can you do, would you know where is uh lilith without me googling where is lilith as a screeching owl uh, mentioned uh, in the old it, testament it's either in isaiah or jeremiah okay. i can't uh, I can't remember which. It's in it's in one of the major prophets, I think. Yeah, um, even though the word Lilith is not used, but it's there in Hebrew. But when you read the translation in English, it usually says a screeching owl, which commentators, theologians are translating that it's usually associated with one of the pagan deities and demons, right? Well, yeah, it's we we know like uh, uh, similar like the similar names in parallel cultures the. Uh, uh, Lilith or Lilitu, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere in the dictionary of deities and demons in the Bible. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Then we have uh, other references to this in the Dead Sea Scrolls or in the Aramaic incantation bowls uh, and so forth. So it's a very it's a very early thing. They knew they knew about the, whatever uh, this thing or these things were. Yeah, and that made cool. such a rabbit hole. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. That's amazing because, I mean, the whole channel was inspired by the work of Dr. Michael Heiser, which I mentioned when I started the channel like, a couple months ago. And Dr. Michael Heiser explains these things, not just him, authors similar to him. And that was one of the things. And he was one of the main people that inspired me with the channel. So it's perfectly fine because we're still staying in the theme of the whole channel which is, you know, all these principalities, powers, and uh, thrones, including the fallen Elohim and the de demonic. That's one of the main passions I have about, you know, when it comes to reading and talking about this. So this perfectly, um, you know, combines with the work of fiction because, you know, right. it's all connected. Um, well, I'm very thrilled to have you both on the channel, um, including last time and today. Um, I'm thankful for your time because I know that you're both busy men. You, Zachariah, with writing million pages a day, <laughs> and you, Daniel, with being a new, newly father. Um, so I really thank you for your 
you know, for your time. I believe that, um, you know, the viewers will benefit from all your wisdom and experience and knowledge when it comes to uh, writing fiction and storytelling. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward in the future when we will be discussing some other topics. But yeah, thank you once again. Uh, God bless you. And I wish both of you um, to succeed in your uh, works of writing fiction to be published and to be sold in uh, many copies, not just because of material gain, even though thank God for those things, but it also you can glorify God with uh, the skills he gave you, with the vision, with um, all this imagination that can be divine, that can be um, sanctified and baptized in Christ and used for a good purpose. So thank you for using your gifts and not bearing them, uh, you know, and hiding them, but using them uh, for the kingdom. So thank you once again. God bless, and I'll see you next time. Thanks again. This was a privilege. Thank you.